my video series, I have come up with a few extracts from the Merchant of Venice. I have been receiving emails to this effect and though I know that it will be difficult for me to do the entire drama because of my uh, other commitments and my time constraints but hopefully I should be able to do some of the extracts from the Merchant of Venice. In today's video, we will do Act 2, Scene 2. In this portion that I have chosen from the play, this is the scene where Portia is commenting upon the various suitors. What will we see in this video? First, there will be a line-by-line -line explanation of the text. Then, we will look at this portion from the examination point of view and see what are the characteristic traits of Portia as revealed in this extract? This is an important question. And finally, we will look at a brief summary of the scene so that you can remember what you have studied. So let's begin. The portion that I've chosen is midway through the scene from the dialogue of Nerissa where she says, Your father was ever virtuous, and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly but one who you shall rightly love. Now, Nerissa says, Your father, whose father? Portia's father, was ever virtuous. He was a virtuous man. He was a holy man. And holy men at their death have good inspirations. Holy men, men who are pious, before they die, they have good inspirations. They have divine promptings. They have directions from God himself. Therefore, the lottery that he had devised, so the lottery of the caskets that was devised or planned or put into place by Portia's father, in these three chests of gold, silver and lead. So we know what was a the lottery. There were three chests or three caskets made of gold, silver and lead. And... She says, whereof, who chooses his meaning chooses you. Whoever is able to guess the correct meaning, make a right choice of the casket, will be able to win Portia, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly, but one who you shall rightly love. In other words, Nerissa is reassuring Portia that there is no doubt that whoever makes a right choice of the casket will be somebody who rightly deserves Portia's love. But what warmth is there in your affection towards any of these princely suitors that are already come? Now Nerissa says, but let me know, what warmth is there in your affection? How much affection do you have towards any of these princely suitors? Some suitors have come, they are princely suitors. They are royal people. They all come from noble families that are already come. So we are now going to see the suitors who have come to meet Portia. Nerissa is asking, what warmth is there in your affection? How much do you like them? Is there any of these towards whom you feel a certain sense of affection? Portia says, I pray thee, I request you, overname them. Overname them, name them one by one, name them in a series. And as thou namest them, I will describe them. As you take their name, I will describe them. And according to my description, level at my affection. And the way I describe them, according to my description, the way I describe them, you guess, you judge, you gauge my level of affection. You decide for yourself how much I love the person or how much do I like that person. Nerissa says, 
First, there is the Neapolitan prince. The first suitor is a Neapolitan prince or the prince of Naples. Portia. Aye, yes, that's a cold indeed. He is a young horse himself. For he doth nothing because he does nothing but talk of his horse. This Neapolitan prince talks only about his horse and he makes it a great appropriation to his own good parts and he considers it a great appropriation, a great addition to his own good parts. Your good parts means his good qualities. He feels it is an addition to his good qualities that he can shoe him himself. That he, the Neapolitan prince, can shoe him, that is his horse, himself. So basically, shoeing a horse is the work of a blacksmith. Now this Neapolitan prince takes pride that he can shoe a horse himself. That certainly speaks of a lack of nobility in his character, a lack of nobility in his birth. So the way Portia describes the Neapolitan prince, she calls him a colt. This explains that what is her sense of affection towards this Neapolitan prince? Well, zero. Nerissa. Then there is the county palatine. She talks about the second suitor now. County Palatine, he is a count, which is again, a, he is like a lord. He is a nobleman from Palatinate. Portia, he doth nothing but frown. Now this County Palatine, he does nothing but he frowns. He is all the time frowning. As who should say, and you will not have me, choose. He goes about with a certain expression on his face. And what does that expression seem to say? It is as if he's saying to Portia, and you will not have me. You don't want to marry me. Then choose, then make your own choice. In that case, you will be the loser. So here the county palatine goes about with a certain expression on his face, which seems to say, if you do not have me. If you do not marry me, it's your loss. You can make a choice. You can marry anybody else. It would not matter to me. He hears merry tales. He hears merry tales, happy stories and smiles not and yet he does not smile. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old. I fear Portia is afraid he, County Palatine, will prove the weeping philosopher. Now here there is an allusion to a person by the name of Heraclitus. This person Heraclitus from a place was from a place called Ephesus. He was said to be very sad. He was said to be somebody who wept and who mourned over the stupidity of mankind. And so he retired to the mountains. So Portia says, I am afraid this county palatine will become like the weeping philosopher Heraclitus when he grows old. Why? Being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. Because this young county palatine is full of unmannerly sadness. He is full of sadness which does not behoove him, which does not suit him. Though he is a young man, he is very sad. I had rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. Portia says, I would rather marry a death's head. Your death's head refers to a skull with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. So she says, I do not wish to marry the Neapolitan prince. I do not wish to marry County Palatine. God defend me from these two. So from the way she has described County Palatine, what is the level of affection towards the second suitor? Again, the answer is nil. Nerissa, how say you by the French lord 
Monsieur Libon. Now there's another person. He's a French lord. What do you say about him? What do you have to say about him? Portia. God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. In other words, Portia says, God has created him a man, so that's fine. Let him pass for a man. In other words, he is not much of a man. In truth, I know it is a sin to be a mocker. Truthfully, I know it is a sin to be a mocker. I should not mock him. I should not ridicule him. But he? Why? He had the horse better than the Neapolitans. But he, he is not much of a man. He seems to have a horse better than the Neapolitans. What is she trying to say? If the Neapolitan prince only talks about his horse all the time, this person seems to have a horse better than the Neapolitans. He talks more of his horse than the Neapolitan prince. A better bad habit of frowning than the Count Palatine. If County Palatine was always frowning, the French lord, Monsieur Libon, seems to have a better bad habit of frowning. He frowns all the more. He is every man in no man. He's every man in no man. He does not have an identity of his own. He does not have a distinct personality of his own. If a throstle sing, if he hears the singing of a bird, a common bird, like a thrush, if he hears a bird sing, he falls straight or capering. He starts dancing straight away, capering, dancing. If he hears a bird sing, he simply starts dancing. He will fence with his own shadow. He's so foolish, he will fence. He will fight with a sword with his own shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry 20 husbands. If I marry him, I feel I have married 20 different people because he does not have a personality of his own. If he would despise me, if he hates me, if he is full of contempt towards me, I would forgive him. I will forgive him for if he loved me to madness, but if he loves me to the point of madness, I shall never require him. I shall never be able to return his love. If he loves me even to the point of madness, I shall never be able to love him back. So basically, Portia is saying the French Lord Monsieur Libon is effeminate in his habits. He is very much like a girl. This is what she does not like about him. Nerissa, what say you then to Falcon Bridge, the young baron of England? The next suitor, Falcon Bridge. He is a baron. Again, that's a noble title. That's a noble designation. Portia, you know, I say nothing to him. For he understands not me nor I him. So basically the problem with Falcon Bridge is he does not know the other languages. He says nothing to me and I say nothing to him. He does not understand me nor do I understand him. He had neither Latin, French nor Italian. Now this is an important line because this shows that, the, that this young baron of England he is not a scholar. The knowledge of Latin, French, Italian was supposed to be important for a young man. He should have been a learned man. And you will come into court and swear that I have a poor penny worth in the, and in the English. So Portia says and she tells uh, Nerissa, you will come into the court and swear that I have a poor penny worth. Poor penny worth? I hardly have any knowledge of English. He is a proper man's picture. He is a proper man's picture. He looks very handsome. He is very handsome. He's a very good looking man. He's a proper man's picture. A very good looking man. But alas, who can converse with a dumb show? However, there is the difficulty of communicating with him. He does not understand Latin. He does not know French. He does not know Italian. How long can I converse with him as if I'm conversing with a dumb person? So the illusion over here is 
the kind of sign language a person might use when he is referring to a hearing impaired person. So she says he is a very good looking man but he doesn't know the languages. I cannot talk to him. I cannot communicate with him. How oddly he is suited. Now she finds his dressing sense extremely ridiculous. She says how oddly, how strange is his dressing sense. He is suited. He is dressed in a very strange way. I think he bought his doublet in Italy. He bought his doublet, a jacket in Italy. His round horse in France. Your horse refers to it could be breeches in France. His bonnet in Germany. His headgear like a cap or a hat is bought from Germany and his behavior everywhere. So a young baron of England seems to be a dandy, somebody who is extremely concerned with his style, with his looks, and apparently seems to be shallow in nature, shallow in his character, doesn't have much brains. Next, said Nerissa, what think you of the Scottish lord, his neighbour? Now, England and Scotland are neighbours. Therefore, she says, what do you think of the Scottish lord, his neighbour? Portia, that he hath a neighbourly chariot in him. He has charity. He has kindness for his neighbour. Why? Because Scotland and England are neighbouring countries. So, Portia says, that he hath a neighbourly charity in him. He has kindness or love for his neighbour. Why? For he borrowed a box of the year of the Englishman and swore he would pay him back again when he was able. Now what happened? The, the Englishman gave the Scottish Lord a box on his ear. He punched him on his ear. Now ideally, the Scottish Lord should have retaliated. He should have punched the Englishman back. But he simply borrowed it. That means he did not give it back. He did not retaliate. He simply swore. He promised he would pay him again when he was able. When the time was right, when he would get an opportunity, then he would pay him back. So immediately he did not retaliate. And therefore Portia is sarcastic and says she, that he has a neighborly charity in him. I think the Frenchman became a surety and sealed under for another. Now, when this happened, when the Englishman boxed the Scottish Lord, the Frenchman happened to be there. And the Frenchman said, yes, I am a surety. He will pay him back. And because the Frenchman became a surety, the Englishman sealed under him under for another. The Englishman gave him one more punch. So what happened? The Scottish Lord took a box from the Englishman. He did not retaliate. The Frenchman who was present, he said, yes, the Scottish Lord would retaliate. But sometime later, and so the Englishman gave him one more punch. So what was the problem with the Scottish Lord? He was a coward. Nerissa, how like you, the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew, the other person, is the other suitor is a young German from Saxony. He is the Duke of Saxony's nephew. Portia, very wildly in the morning when he is sober. So this young German in the morning when he is sober, when he is still not drunk, she finds him very wild. She finds him very awful. She despises him in the morning when he is sober. And most wildly in the afternoon when he's drunk. By afternoon, this young German, he is completely drunk. And then she says, I find him most vile, most awful. When he is best, he is a little worse than a man. And when he is worst, he is a little better than a beast. So what she wants to say is that he is worse than an animal and the worst fall that ever fell and the worst fall that ever fell under the worst circumstances that might befall me I hope I shall make shift to go without him I hope I have to manage without him 
In other words, even under the worst circumstances, I would not like to marry this man. Nerissa, if he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. So Nerissa says, if he, if this young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew, he offers to make a choice of the casket. And if he happens to choose the right casket, will you refuse to marry him? Will you refuse to perform your father's will? Will you refuse to go by what your father has decided if you refuse to accept him? Portia says, Therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, I request you, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. Now Portia says, I am afraid the worst might come true. So I pray, she tells Nerissa, I pray, I request you, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine. Keep a deep glass of Rhenish wine. Your deep could refer to the deep dark red color of the wine. A deep glass of Rhenish wine. Rhenish wine, it's an expensive wine. It is produced in the Rhine region in Germany. I pray thee set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket, on the wrong casket. For if the devil be within and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. So what is Portia saying? I know for sure he is such a drunkard that even if the devil is inside the casket, if the devil be within and the temptation without, the temptation refers to this glass of wine, but that temptation is out on the casket, I know he will choose it. He's such a drunkard, he will choose the casket which has the glass of wine. I will do anything, Nerissa, or before I will be married to a sponge. So she calls this young man a sponge. Why? Because he does not drink wine. He does not drink alcohol. He soaks it like a sponge. <clears throat> Nerissa, you need not fear, lady, the having any of these lords. Nerissa says, don't be afraid, my dear lady, the having any of these lords. None of these lords would become, would come to make a choice of the caskets. They have acquainted me with their determination. They have informed me. All these six suitors have acquainted me, informed me about their determination, their decision. What is the decision? Which is indeed to return to their home. All of them have decided that they will go back to their home and to trouble you with no more suit. They will not trouble you with any more requests unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition depending upon the caskets. So all these suitors have told Nerissa that they do not wish to attempt the lottery of the caskets. They want to go back to their homes. They do not want to trouble Portia anymore. Why? Because they don't want to attempt the lottery of the caskets. Why do they not want to attempt the lottery of the caskets? Because all of them had to swear to abide by three important conditions. And these suitors do not love Portia enough to take that oath which the father had said that every suitor must take. So they say they will return to their homes. They will not trouble her, trouble Portia unless there is another way of winning Portia. Unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition depending on the caskets. They are not willing to attempt the lottery of the caskets. Portia. If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. Here we find Portia's character a trait. She is an extremely loyal and a dutiful daughter. She says, even if I live to be as old as Sibylla. Who was Sibylla? She was a prophetess. She had received a boon which said that the years of a life 
would be as many as the grains of sand that she would hold in her hand. So in other words, Sibylla lived a very, very long life. So Portia says, even if I grow old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana. Chaste as Diana, why? Because Diana was the moon goddess. She is referred to many a times in the play. She was also the goddess of hunting. She is called chaste because she never married. She was the virgin goddess. So Portia says, even if I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will remain unmarried, chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will, unless somebody marries me in the manner my father has decided. I am glad this parcel of wooers are so reasonable. I am happy that this batch of suitors, these six people, are so reasonable. They have decided to return to their homes, for there is not one among them, but I dote on his very presence. There is not one among these six whose very absence I will miss. I dote on his very absence. I will not miss a single one of them. And I pray God, grant them a fair departure. I pray to God, let them have a safe journey back home. So that was the line by line explanation. I had to go a little fast, but you can see the video once again for better understanding. Now, the question that is important here is, what are the characteristics of Portia that you can see in this particular scene? The first thing, her judgment of every suitor is unerring, no mistake. She has a very clear understanding of the judgment of the suitors. We see she makes fun of them, she ridicules them, but yet by what they decide to do towards the end, it tells us that her judgment of these people has been extremely precise, very true. She has sparkling wit. She is very witty in the way she makes her comments about these suitors. It also shows she has a keen sense of humor. She, love, she loves to have a laugh. She can make fun of them. She pokes fun. She ridicules the absurdity, the ridiculous behavior of these people, the follies, the foolishness of their characters. However, she remains a loyal daughter, very dutiful, mindful of her duties. Here she becomes an absolute contrast to Jessica, as you see later in the play. So finally, as a summary of the scene, what will you remember from your examination point of view? So there are six suitors. It's a good idea to remember them in the order in which they appear in the text. That way, you will not get confused about their characteristics. So if the first suitor is the Neapolitan prince, what is his problem? Why does Portia not like him? He lacks nobility of birth and character, takes pride in shoeing a horse. The next character, County Palatine, he is ill-tempered, full of melancholy. Portia says he has an unmannerly sadness. Next, Monsieur Libon, he is effeminate, very girlish, so to speak, with no distinct personality. Falconbridge, he is a dandy a fop and to add to that he has a lack of learning he's not a scholar the scottish lord is a coward not brave the duke of saxony's nephew he's a drunkard now why i have highlighted not a scholar not brave over here is because later in the play in the same scene when you hear about bassanio you remember there is a line which says a scholar and a soldier. So Bassanio was the best of the lot. Why? Because he was a scholar. That means he had brains and he was a soldier. That means he had brawn. So he was a, an absolutely eligible bachelor for Portia. Also in the scene, remember the allusions. Now this year in the examination, 
the three sisters, the uh, sisters three that had come in the examination. So keeping that in mind, you do not want to be unprepared. Please touch upon all the allusions that you get in your uh, text. So that there are three allusions. The allusion to the weeping philosopher Heraclitus. Sibylla the prophetess who was uh, given the boon of a very very long life and Diana the goddess, the goddess of chastity and the goddess of hunting. So with this we come to the end of today's lesson. I hope you have understood what I've tried to explain. I hope it is of some benefit to you. I just wanted to tell you that I have an Instagram account on which I keep posting certain questions and exercises so perhaps they might come in handy if you want to do a bit of extra revision so please do check that out thank you children happy learning